Good evening. Welcome to St. Mark the Evangelist and thank you for worshiping with us. St. Mark, please ask that you keep your mask on at all times while attending Mass. We want to ensure we are all keeping all of our parishioners safe. Thank you for your cooperation and understanding. The parish office will be closed Monday, September 7th in observance of Labor Day. Thank you for your understanding.
the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The grace and the peace of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In the gospel today, Jesus instructs us how we're supposed to fight. We have a gospel that's all about love, and if we're all about love, then conflict with each other is much about love as anything is about love. So it's how we fight that's important. So as we think of all of these ways that love makes a call on how we live our lives, for those times when we've been embittered, spoken in anger, been degrading of other people or even of ourselves, we ask God's mercy and compassion. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done, in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, by whom we are redeemed and receive adoption, look graciously upon your beloved sons and daughters, that those who believe in Christ may receive true freedom and an everlasting inheritance. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Please be seated. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord, you, son of man, I have appointed watchmen for the house of Israel. When you hear me say anything, you shall warn them for me. If I tell the wicked, a wicked one, you shall surely die. And you do not speak out to dissuade the wicked one from his way. The wicked shall die for his guilt but I will hold you responsible for his death. But if you warn the wicked, trying to turn away from his way, and he refuses to turn away from his way, he shall die for his guilt, but you shall save yourself. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Come, let us sing joyfully to the Lord. Let us acclaim the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us joyfully sing songs to him. If today, if today you hear his voice, voice harden not your hearts. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord who made us, for he is our God, and we are the people he shepherds, the flock he guides. If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Oh, that today you would hear his voice, harden not your hearts at Mirabah, as in the day of Massah in the desert, where your fathers tempted me, they tested me, though they had not seen my works. If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, 
Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no evil to the neighbor. Hence, love is the fulfillment of the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won over your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you so that every fact may be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. Amen, I say to you, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, amen, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything for which they are to pray, it shall be granted to them by my heavenly Father. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. The Gospel of the Lord. So it's really, I think, helpful to look at weirdness in, America, in world culture, because if you can see it at a distance, you might recognize it in your own culture and have a different, for a difference, uh, an appreciation of it. In 1745, one of the most important novels in the last 200 years was published, and it was called The Sorrows of Young Werther. And it's a German novel written by a man named Goethe. And it swept Europe. It really is, in a sense, the beginning of romantic literature, at least what popularizes romantic literature. And all you have to do is look at all the romance novels on the shelves, or if you look at uh, any number of movies on or off the Hallmark Channel, uh, that you'll find these stories about romance, right? And you agree with me that a lot of them aren't very realistic. They have nice feelings to them. But, you know, at the end, when these two fine-looking people kiss, jump into the red convertible, roar off into the sunset, don't you want to see that relationship 40 years later? Uh, Everybody's got 30 more pounds and five kids. And it's just a different relationship. But that is not what romance is. Uh, And so the story of the sorrows of young Werther is a story about a man named Werther who loves a girl named Charlotte, who's engaged to a man named Albert. When he meets Charlotte, he knows that she's engaged, but she can't get her mind off her. He's constantly pursuing her because he knows that he can win her. And so every romantic thing you can imagine, young Werther does. But Charlotte grew up in a nice family. She raised her little brothers and sisters And what she really wants is a husband that's going to show up for dinner on time, provide for the family, be a good example to the kids and kind to her. Uh, And she will love that man, and he will love her. And she sees that in Albert, but not in Werther. Though she really likes Werther, and she's very flattered that she's interested in her. Not good enough for Werther. And so he has to do something dramatic, because this is a romantic novel, right? And so now he must take his own life, which he does. 
Okay, you've heard the story. Are you going to run out and buy that book and read it? Because lots of people in 1745 did that all through Europe. In fact, it was like this publishing sensation. They had to ban in Leipzig, Germany, young men from wearing the costume of young Werther, which was a blue frock coat, a yellow waistcoat, beige pants, and tall black boots that would go up to the knees, if you remember those fashions from your youth, or at least from pictures you've seen. So, because uh, young men were committing suicide. They banned the sale of the book in some German cities. And you know, that copycat kind of thing that we see in our modern culture, we didn't invent it. And so if we didn't invent it, and human beings were doing this at least 200 plus years ago, do you think it says something about love? Because young Werther thought he loved, you know, here's what chaste love is. Chaste love is about justice. It's about justice in family and relationship. That's what chaste love is. Unchaste love is about injustice. And so here's what justice is. It's the right ordering of who you are. It's having your life together. And what it means is to have your life together, your appetites, need to be under the control of your reason. Does that sound plausible? That is a pretty simple explanation of, of, of chastity. But when it gets inverted, your emotions are running your life. That's what a lack of chastity is. And it doesn't just have to be the emotions associated with sexual attraction. It could be anger. It could be appetites like hunger. All of these things are what brings disorder into the human house. Now, what happens? The body, the temple. So what happens when your appetites get so disordered that you focus on the one thing that you need to be happy? And that one thing for young Werther was the hand of Charlotte. And when he couldn't have her, according to Goethe, his reason for living ended. And so what if the one thing isn't Car Charlotte? What if it's money? What if it's drugs or booze? Anything that you put into the one place reserved for God. Because that's really when we talk about sin, distortion, and salvation is how do you so screw up the order in your life that it becomes absolutely self-destructive? Now, you can see that in that novel, can't you, as I explained it to you? So if that's what an obsessive love is, and it's the inversion of chastity, because wouldn't it have been nice if at the end of the novel, Verta says, I love you, Charlotte, and I love Albert, and you're right. This guy's great for you. It makes me so happy that you found just the right person. I'd always love to be part of your life. Just, if nothing else, I could support the joy that you have in your marriage. And I'd say, young Verta really loves Charlotte, right? But that isn't what happens. And so chastity. Chastity is about getting your loves in the right order. How do you do that? If the fundamental drive in your life is love. How do you do that? The gospel today says the way that you do that is you learn how to fight like a lover fights. So now think about the story of the gospel, because what it says is, is that every one of us has the duty to work for the salvation of other people. And if salvation is that you come into complete communion with God, who is love itself, how would you ever wanted to deny anybody that? It would be irrational. If you think salvation is dominating another person as so they think exactly like you, well, that's not even love, right? That's manipulation and domination. Salvation is wanting to share love with another person. So what happens when love is at risk because of how two people interact? Here's what Jesus says. He says, Here's how you love another person when you fight. 
First, if someone sins against you, you've been the subject of injustice. The second thing you do is you go and you talk to that person. If that person doesn't take you seriously, you go to a couple of people who know what's going on and is known to these people and you sit down together. So it's not just a personal conflict. You see the communal, the communal aspect of this. And if that doesn't work, the, third, the fourth thing you do is you go to the authority of the church. So the idea of treating them like a Gentile and a tax collector, right? Is Jesus loved Gentiles and tax collectors. He healed Gentile women. He had dinner with tax collectors. He didn't shun them, not by any stretch of the imagination. But they didn't become disciples. They don't come to communion. They weren't at the Last Supper. And so that's what excommunication is. And it's really rooted in this story. And if you think about the stories of the last three Sundays, do you remember two Sundays ago? It's all about authority in the church. It's you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And then the second thing is what leadership looks like. You've got to pick up your cross. And this third part is how do you love when there's going to be conflicts? Because there's a lot of conflicts in the early church. The scriptures are full of them. So think of that. Your experience of being sinned against, talking to the other person, bringing it to a larger community, looking for authority. Because why this is important, and we talk about it, or I talk about it in context of chastity, your life is not siloed. Your life isn't compartmentalized. There is just one of you. You're who you are in your family, you're who you are in the workplace, you're who you are in your social life, you're who you are when you come to church. If you have little different personalities at each place, this is a bad sign. That's compartmentalization. An integrated life is you are who you are wherever you are. And so, think about it like this. If you want your kids to learn how to be good citizens. They have to experience love in their family. That first face they see is hopefully the loving face of their mom and dad, right? Looking over the crib, holding back their older brother who wants to take the new baby back to the hospital. But they don't do it. So the second thing is, is if you can learn how to negotiate love in your family, well, maybe you could replicate that when you start your own family. And if you can learn to love a spouse, you may learn to teach those lessons to your children that you either learned or wish you learned from your parents. And if you can teach that to your children to come into your life, maybe they will learn to love a stranger. And if they can learn to love a stranger, they might learn to love their enemies. And if they can learn to love their enemies, you see, this is all a ladder to God, which is the center of life. So here's a couple of things to think about. Because I, we obviously have a lot of conflict in our country. And we have conflict in families. You talk to the local police during this time of pandemic. Um, complaints of domestic violence have increased dramatically. So have suicides. So to talk about these things is very timely. But here's the things I like to think about. So how do you take this? which is how the church works, which how a nation should work, because it's how the domestic church in your family works. First, someone sins against you. And so your interior life. Young Verta got in trouble because he obsessed, right? So what if you do if oh, you sit there in your room and you just spin it around in your head all the time? It's just this record you can't get off of. Here's the thing, know the wisdom to differentiate between something you can do something about and something that you need to talk to another person about. That's really the first thing. Get out of your head and decide whether this is something I need to move on or at least need to, to talk about it. Here's the second thing. How about the sense of community? Or at least when you have this conversation between the other person. If someone walks up to you and they're going to confront you and they say to you, I know what you think. Doesn't that kind of telegraph when you say that to another person that you've already had the complete conversation in your mind and you've mapped out exactly how this argument should go? It's domination and manipulation about another person. 
That is never chaste love. You can't use other people in your mind in angry ways. And you should let other people be who they are, whatever the argument is. Third thing, how about the communal dimension of an argument? You know, I have talked to a lot of people in 22 years, and a lot of kids, and here's what I always get, kids know when there's conflict in the house. You think you're keeping it from them, grandparents, parents, but they, they're just wired to know it. They're very sensitive. They don't need to hear a blow by blow as to what the, ju- the relative justice, in, justice and injustice is in the argument, right? But you know, if you want to show them how to be happy in love, they have to be comfortable in how to have conflict in love. And so to sit down and tell children that mom and dad are having an argument, you have arguments, we're preparing you for a life where when you love people, you'll have arguments with them because that is what part of love is. See, if you never argue with somebody, it means either you or the other person is nothing more than a human paperweight. Chase love is between two ad- people. And two people are that. Two people. And so this story in the gospel is how you negotiate conflict. So the fourth thing is authority. Well, mom and dad, right? The kids cannot be an authority in the house. Uh, We have authority in our country that's exercised in ways that uh, some people agree with, others disagree with. But at the end of the day, it's what authority looks like, just or unjust. Now, here's the question I want you to ask. How often does an appeal to authority solve your problems? When the Supreme Court of the United States says abortion is legal up until after birth, does that remove all your qualms about it? Has authority solved that problem for you? When the Constitution of the United States said that Africans and American Indians are, it's either two-thirds or three-quarters of a human being. Does it become so by legislative fiat? Because that's a court, that's the Congress, a congressional Congress, I mean a constitutional Congress. We had an American Civil War about it. Abortion was decided 50 years ago. Have these exercises of authority resolved racism or desire to protect children? It hasn't stopped any of these fights. When you appeal to authority in the church or out, it has limited ability to resolve heartfelt disagreements. And so what do you do with authority? You know who's been a good example of the role of authority is uh, Pope Francis. And he's been getting battered. But think about how he exercises his papal authority. Because there are limits to what authority can accomplish. So do you remember last year, the year before, there was the Amazon Synod, and the Pope allowed them to talk about the ordination of viri probati, older married men to the priesthood. And there was the Catholic press lit up pro and con about it. A vote was taken, mostly bishops. Two thirds, I think it was. Some, it was a strong majority said, we ought to be ordaining married men. The Pope wanted it discussed, and it was discussed everywhere. Then, a few months later, when he issued his post exhortation, he didn't even mention the issue. For him, it got discussed. People thought what they thought about it. And the truth is, in marriage, in the country, some of this stuff are things that we're just going to be talking about long after any of us are dead. Here's another way that the Pope has dealt with it. Do you remember uh, about the idea of having a commission to decide or to, to look into the question of whether the church could ordain women to the diaconate? Do you remember any of that? Well, it happened. It happened twice in our lifetime. And both times, could is different than should, right? Could is, does the church have the authority? Should is, is it pastorally wise? So the question is, could. And both times it came back, and there were arguments for both sides. 
And when the last report came in, the Pope said, we must still continue talking about this. You know, with Americans, we want to push it to the bloody end. Let's get it resolved and get it behind us. But the truth is, authority rarely can give you that kind of peace of mind. So talking about things in marriage and out is constantly working through an issue until you really see what the issue is. You know, I've talked about that novel and about obsession. And obsession is a lack of chastity because it makes a person a thing. You have to possess them like they're a thing. You know, in an argument where you let people walk away at the end, why that's love? It's because you have respected their individuality, even if their individuality includes rejecting the gospel in the church. But that's what love is. It's what makes love dangerous. And yes, wouldn't it have been a great end to that novel of Werther? If he had stayed alive, supported that marriage, and then someday is made the godparent for one of these kids. Because even when you're disappointed in some aspect of love, in the church, in the nation, in personal relationship, if you learn to handle conflict, not make anything in this world the center of your life, but pleasing God, at the center of your life. There's always a path to a happy future. Past all the pratfalls, the traps that this world has to offer. Did you notice how Jesus ended the gospel today? I'll read it to you. Amen, amen, I say to you if, you, if two of you agree on earth about anything for which they are to pray, it shall be granted to them by my heavenly Father. How does Jesus feel about two people agreeing? Paraphrase it in my translation. If you people could agree on anything, I would bless it. As long as it was good. And it gives you a sense of what the gospel is and why it is that arguing, conflict, if you understand it chastely, is not about winning, it's not about domination, it's not about manipulation. It's about how you love another person. Kind of warm in here, isn't it? I'll have to complain to somebody. Who's running this joint anyway? I don't know why. It's, it's on a timer. So there's, something's happened. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. And it's with trust in the goodness of God that we call upon his sacred name in prayer. For the church, that may we, we may reach out and assist our neighbors in reconciling with God and each other, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord. For leaders of nations, that they may grow in wisdom, seeking peaceful ways to resolve differences with others as they serve the people entrusted to them, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For those who work for a living, that they may receive a just wage for their labors, and for those who are unemployed or underemployed, that they may not lose heart, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. That our parish community may always welcome those whose souls are thirsting for spiritual nourishment and those whose hearts are searching for reconciliation, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Dominique Lefebvre, Thomas Kisiara and family, and the repose of the soul of Sue Ritzy, for whom this Mass is being offered, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Father, we thank you for all your gifts. We offer you our prayers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, 
who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Blessed are you, Lord, O God of all creation, for through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made, will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord, O God of all creation, for through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become for us our spiritual drink. Pray that your sacrifice and mine be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. O oh God, who give us the gift of true prayer and of peace, graciously grant that through this offering we may do fitting homage to your divine majesty, and by partaking of the sacred mystery, we may be faithfully united in mind and heart through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For you lay the foundations of the world and have arranged the changing of times and seasons. You formed man in your own image and set humanity over the whole world in all its wonder, to rule in your name over all you have made, and forever praise you in your mighty works through Christ our Lord. And so with all the angels we praise you, as in joyful celebration we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at the time he was betrayed, and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, 
And once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith, save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Edward, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray. Now with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, Graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer one another a sign of that peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us your peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Together with the people at home, let us do an act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things. I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. 
Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. Grant that your faithful, O Lord, whom you nourish and endow with life through the food of your word and heavenly sacrament, may so benefit from your beloved Son's great gifts that we may merit an eternal share in his life, who lives and reigns forever in death. Hey, good news, I, I felt the air conditioning come on right in the middle of the Eucharistic prayer. So <laughs> there you have it. And so communion will be out, outside, okay? The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Mass is ended. Go in the peace of Christ.